What's up guys, Jared here. I just watched the South Park post-COVID return of COVID special and it was good. Man, it was good. All of the things that underwhelmed me about the post-COVID special were completely redeemed here. This was some top-notch South Park. So let's dive in. So one of the things in my post-COVID video that I was critical of was the notion that a benevolent Cartman doesn't work, but I think the setup in part one paid off in a really special way. So a lot of us expected this to be an elaborate scheme to troll Kyle, that him being Jewish was just an elaborate troll, but instead we get to see Cartman progressively revert to his old manipulative scheming ways, and this time we get to see him use genuine good to justify it. Or maybe that it's just the mere proximity to Kyle will inevitably make Eric descend into his old ways. I think this was such a much smarter move that instead of just showing Eric to be a troll like he always is, to show that even the best version of Cartman is still conniving. And at the end of the day, what's funnier? Cartman being an elaborate prankster, or Cartman one-upping Kyle's Jewishness by framing himself and his family as Holocaust victims being persecuted by Kyle? It's so funny. Also, last time I said that I expected that South Park, the show known to unapologetically stick the middle finger up to Hollywood limousine liberal culture, would continue in that tradition and not only make fun of the way that conservatives are acting stupid about the pandemic. In this episode, they not only continued to lampoon anti-vaxxers, but also showed us a future police state where the town is in lockdown for decades because of one unvaccinated person. Because that's one of the special things about South Park to me. I mean, everyone, every show on television, every show that's made by, you know, Hollywood and people around Hollywood, they all make fun of the right side of the culture war. And now granted, there's a lot to make fun of. But still, there's still plenty of idiocy happening on the other side of the aisle too. And if I can't get that perspective from South Park, there are few other places where I can. So I appreciated that development. Another thing about this episode is that it reminded me how much I respect that Trey Parker doesn't really care very much about plot. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this whole thing about Cartman wanting to kill Kyle so he doesn't lose his family, only for his wife to then say, we have to let him change the past and leave it to chance unless we end up just like him. And then Cartman becomes murderous anyway by killing Clyde. It doesn't make much sense. I mean, if Cartman's wife is concerned that Kyle is driving him to be violent and unkind, then Cartman murdering Clyde, and he, you know, whatever. Point is, it doesn't matter. What matters is how emotionally fulfilling it is to see Kyle and Cartman duke it out harder than they ever have. I mean, we've seen them fight a little bit in the past, but usually Kyle just hits him once and then Cartman runs away crying. But this was like the, the buildup of, you know, literally decades of rivalry. And not only that, but it's more important for, you know, them to perpetuate nonsensical I hate Uncle Kyle jokes from the kids. Daddy, I don't want to be alive if it means I have to be like Uncle Kyle. But the most important thing is that the fight quickly transitions into Stan and Kyle recognizing the importance of their relationship before being saved by Eric. Because ultimately, it's the emotion that matters. Whereas in a Christopher Nolan movie, oftentimes it feels like the plot is the point. It's so complex and cool. Just because an idea is overly convoluted and complex doesn't make it cool. Going to multiple dream levels sounds like a really stupid idea. You just don't get it because you're not smart enough. Let's move! Now, I just want to qualify here that I think that's only kind of true because, in a way, I don't even think Nolan thinks the plot of his movies are all that important and that ultimately the plot is just a vehicle 
for a visceral cinematic experience meant to be seen or experienced in a theater with a community of people. Which is why I still haven't seen Tenant, because if I can't see it in a theater, then what's the point? But anyway, I digress. The point is, is sometimes storytelling is like music. It doesn't really matter what the lyrics say, as long as they carry the tune to its emotional ends. Another thing is that, at the end of the previous episode, the new COVID variant was called COVID Triple Plus Max or something like that. But, again, due to the recent announcement of the Omicron variant, they changed the joke to the McCormicron variant. Because, again, who cares about continuity when you can make a funnier, more relevant joke? And I think it takes balls to really make that call. And I really appreciate that Trey Parker has the guts to do it. So another thing this episode really highlighted for me and something that I think is actually quite underappreciated about South Park in general is that Matt and Trey are great cultural curators. Their Blade Runner references in this episode are some of the best ever. Not only does Randy mimic one of the greatest lines in sci-fi cinema history, like tears in rain like tears in rain but there's also a joke in this reference that only makes sense if you know that the character Roy dies right after he says that dad not now Stan. this is a joke that only no only works if you know Blade Runner really well and this is taking advantage of the success of your show most new shows are are just so preoccupied with finding finding or maintaining an audience that they will only tell jokes that can have the widest appeal possible but not South Park they ta they tell niche cinephile jokes there's also tokens matrix moves Future Clyde arriving in the past with Terminator music in the background. Which is hilarious because it's a great juxtaposition. I mean, Schwarzenegger is an intimidating, chiseled Adonis, and Clyde is a fat slob who peaked in high school. And, you know, throughout the show, they have shown that these dudes not only have immaculate taste and culture, but also very intimate, detailed knowledge of the texts that they reference. And, oh man, the writing was just really sharp in this episode. The scene where Butters explains the NFT scheme to the old ladies not only makes a joke in the dialogue that criticizes NFTs for hardly being unique, but also at the same time visually calls it a pyramid scheme with the Tupperware pyramid. It's so clever. And I think the reveal of Butters was a pretty big cliffhanger in part one. And I had my doubts as to whether they'd be able to deliver something that's funny, unexpected, and appropriate for his character. But man, I, I really think they delivered. I mean, seeing Professor Chaos so chaos, acting like an overzealous crypto zealot was totally unexpected, very current, and very scathing, like Great South Park always is. But perhaps my favorite joke of this episode was Stan having to make amends and calm down his Alexa by showing interest in buying stuff that she recommends to him. Would you like to know more? Yes, yes, I'd like to know more. <sighs> okay, the newest humidifiers from Walgreens Max. This joke is brilliant, so funny, and actually like a really sharp criticism. Because today, algorithms are largely designed to do whatever it takes to grab your attention and prime you for the increased likelihood of a click. So let's use a very extreme, gross example. Girls makeup. And by the way, I think young girls are one of the most vulnerable demographics for these algorithms, by the way. Okay, so the Google and Facebook algorithms work in such a way that they're auctioning off the ability for a company to serve an ad to a user that has a high likelihood to click. 
So in the case of girls' makeup, the algorithm may discover that there's a 5% chance that a particular girl will click on a makeup ad. But if she's shown three consecutive pictures of her more attractive friends with their boyfriends, the algorithm may discover that the chances of her clicking on the makeup ad will increase from 5% to 40%. And so the algorithm is trained to make her feel as ugly as possible, and just when she has reached the peak moment of vulnerability, the algorithm auctions off the ability for these companies to serve her the ad. So the relationship between us and our advertising platforms are already this abusive. And just like in South Park, the only way to temporarily appease them is by doing what they want us to do and buy that makeup. And that's why the final likening of the abusive ad platforms like Amazon with the overzealous proselytizing of NFTs when Butters is ultimately stopped by the pair of Alexas was such a masterstroke. So good. So good. Now the episode's conclusion that we all just need to cut each other some slack and that is ultimately what saves the world is just so wonderful. One of South Park's main comedic theses has always been that we need to stop taking ourselves and the world too seriously. They constantly use hyperbole and exaggeration to make fun of how overly fixated people can be on silly things. Some people are too afraid of gluten. Oh, you see that is dick flying off. Too insane about Black Friday. We uh, douse ourselves in pig blood because it does help us slip through the crowd when the door's open. Too self-righteous about hybrid cars. <sighs> too militantly atheist. Retard alert class! Do you believe in a flying spaghetti monster too, Bubblehead? Too power drunk as a Yelp reviewer. My wife and I are Yelp reviewers, so uh, your best table, please. Too dogmatic about tolerance. You will not make any distinction between people of different color, people with different sexual preferences. You will accept everyone. Some people even uh, <clears throat> take media criticism a little bit too seriously. God damn it, there is no deeper meaning in this book. Read it again. Oh yeah, then why does Sarah Jessica Parker's butt cheese end up in Scrody's milkshake? So not only was this very South Park, but also very pertinent and something I just really agree with. If, for example, you disagree with somebody who doesn't wear a mask, don't demonize them. You can criticize them, but demonizing them goes too far. And lastly, let's talk about new future Cartman. This was really sad. And in a way, it made Cartman a kind of tragic hero. He sacrificed his happiness for the world. This hit me in a really unique way that I'm having trouble describing. I mean, it was heartbreaking, but undeniably powerful. Now, before I sign off, some amazing jokes I want to list were uh, Adult Ike doing the buddy guy friend thing, uh, Randy saying that he the pangolin in every timeline and uh, the time travel paradox of Clyde convincing himself to be an anti-vaxxer. Uh, so that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode as much as I did. I mean, with these two parts taken together, I mean, I really do think that uh, it does almost feel like a movie. And I would even go as far as to say a movie that is... I mean, it's not as good as the South Park movie because the South Park movie is incredible. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely a worthy of being considered a South Park movie, which is in and of itself is, well, it's high praise for me. Just like last time, I'm going to put the link to my original South Park episode script in the description. If you have the time and if you're interested, uh, I'd appreciate it if you read it. Um, give me some feedback. Tell me if you like it or not. And um, probably the next video I'm going to do will be a review of The Matrix Resurrections, which I'm very excited for. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And as always, guys, thanks for watching. Peace.